Hi, my name's Andy, and this video is called Clever Things People Do in Groovy, so you have to know about them. Um, the, I could do a video about uh, how exciting and great Groovy is. In fact, I have done one. It's called um, First Impressions of Groovy Formed by Writing Snake. You can find it in my, uh, my YouTube uploads. Uh, but this is not that. This is um, you've come across Groovy code somewhere else, for example, in a Jenkins file or in a Gradle file, um, and it's confusing. So um, what's really going on? Um, so we'll have a quick look at um, why we would want to do this at all, which um, uh, which I've mentioned some of already. Then we'll talk about some things that are optional in Groovy, um, uh, some ways you can hack around, um, even with built-in stuff using extension methods. Uh, what you can do with operator overloading, uh, and then this thing called, that I'm calling trailing closures. We'll have a quick look at what this all means for build.gradle files, uh, or Gradle build files, uh, and Jenkins files. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit of a play around and we'll be done. So first of all, uh, why are we doing this? Well, um, uh, we experience confusion. If we open up uh, a Gradle file or a Jenkins file, and someone tells us, well, this is Groovy code. Um, that's confusing because it doesn't look like code in any language that we recognize unless we're already quite familiar with Groovy, in which case, um, probably don't need to watch this video. So confusion is my motivation. That's a picture of a confused person. Uh, let's start with some things that are optional. Uh, first of all, let's start off with optional semicolons. So for all of this video, I'm going to show you a, a, a bit of code, which is going to be sort of the whole contents of a a something.groovy file and then I will show you what happens when this program runs so when we run groovy and then the file name um, I'll show you the output so I'm going to be asking you through the video what's what's the output of this program uh, so what's the output of this program well it's the program that contains no semicolons um, groovy is a language that is uh, that allows you to write Java syntax uh, uh, code but also allows you to do a lot of things that are not allowed in Java. So both things are allowed. It's like an extension of Java. Java is like a subset of Groovy. Um, and in this case, I've written code that maybe looks a bit like Java, but there's a few things missing, like there's no type for the variable A, there's no semicolons. So what will this program print out? Well, this program will print out four because A was set to be four, and then we call println, uh, which prints out a thing. That's actually Java's system.out.println method, it's just that you don't have to write the system.out bit, it's automatically there for you in Groovy, because uh, Groovy is all about not wanting to type so many things. So what about this program? What will this program do? Is it the same? Are you ready with your guess? Well, the answer is three. So what, what this program does is it sets B to three, and that's the end, um, because it's worked out that you wanted a semicolon there. And then it's allowed you to say plus one, which just means the number one, and then do nothing with it. Uh, and that's a separate statement, and then we print out B. Um, so hopefully you're starting to get the idea of what some of the rules are about where Groovy will, in inverted commas, insert semicolons um, where it thinks you meant them, which may possibly not be where you think you meant them. What about this program? So the difference here is that there's a trailing backslash. Uh, and like in quite a few languages, a trailing backslash means um, ignore the new line that's coming directly after me. So uh, there's no more characters after that backslash except the new line. Um, so Groovy knows to ignore that new line because you put a backslash there. So the answer is going to be four. Did you get that right? So what about this program? This program's got some extra brackets in it. But otherwise unchanged, what's it going to print? Well, that's going to print 4 as well, because uh, essentially the rule that Groovy uses is if it would make sense for me to stop here, when it hits a new line, Groovy's rule is if it would make sense for me to stop here, or it could make sense for me to stop here, um, so there wouldn't be a parsing error if I stopped here, uh, then insert a semicolon or assume that the statement is finished. So it will take the end of a line uh, to mean... Um, th there should be a semicolon here unless it has a good reason not to. So good reasons not to include 
uh, a trailing backslash like we saw, or if we're in the middle of a bracket or some other um, type of bracket um, or quotation, that means uh, it wouldn't make sense to stop here. So in this case, it wouldn't make sense to stop after the three um, because we're inside, we've already opened a bracket, so we have to go to the end of it. Uh, those rules are similar to what's used in uh, JavaScript, Ruby, uh, and to some extent Python. Um, uh, and as with those languages, you have to be particularly careful. And there's a, there's a couple of things you can't do. So you can't have um, a code block or closure that starts on the next line um, in some cases because... Um, so you can't have a new line before your curly bracket um, because uh, Groovy won't understand what you meant by that. It will think that it, that, that closure is a totally separate statement from the stuff that came before, potentially, under certain circumstances. So you always, uh, 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 fundamentally that means you have to start the line before with your opening curly bracket um, when you're writing things like that, uh, just like in this example. I mean, I wouldn't recommend laying out your code like this, um, but it does do what you presumably intended, whereas if you don't have the brackets, it doesn't. Okay, other things that are optional. Uh, one other thing that's optional uh, is that, uh, uh, using parentheses when you're calling um, a method. So here's a very short piece of code. Um, we define a function called printargs. Uh, it's sort of a method, but we can kind of think of it as a function in Groovy because it's not really, it's not inside a class or it's not explicitly inside a class. Actually in Groovy there's a kind of default magic class being made in the background for you and it becomes, this method, this becomes a method of that, this print args function. But anyway, let's think of it as a function. Um, it takes two arguments, A and B. Notice that we don't have to say the types of A and B. We don't have to say the return type of print args. Um, but that's not important right now. Uh, what is important is that when we call print args, we say print args open bracket one comma two. Uh, what do you think uh, this program prints? Well, let me tell you, it prints a one and then it prints a two, which hopefully you expected. Um, uh, what about this program? This is the same program, except instead of open bracket one comma two on the last line, we've got space three comma four. So what does this program do? Is it an error? Well, hopefully you can judge from the name of this slide. It's not an error. You're allowed to miss out um, the parentheses and just put the arguments with commas in between them. And Groovy figures out you meant to call that method printargs or that function printargs uh, with those two arguments, three and four. So you're allowed to miss them out. Um, it's another way of doing exactly the same thing. What about this? So here we've called printargs with one argument five, uh, close the bracket, and then we've written a six next to it. So is this okay? Is this valid? Groovy, what will this program print? Well, obviously, um, it's not valid. You're trying to call the function print args, but you're only giving it one argument, and then you've written a six later. Uh, so how would that make sense? Well, what about this program? So here we're trying to call the function print args with one argument, uh, and then afterwards, We've got a couple of curly brackets, which in this case um, mean uh, a lambda function or a closure or an anonymous function. So we've just kind of written a function after we've called print args with the wrong number of arguments. Surely that's not right, right? What will this program print? Well, this program will print the five and then um, this uh, a kind of reference to this closure object. So what you've done there is you've called print args with two arguments the five, and then this lambda function or closure uh, as the second argument. So that's a little bit of a flash forward to um, um, trailing closures. This here is a trailing closure. So it is legal in Groovy to miss out the last argument and then give it later or you know, immediately afterwards, so long as it's a closure. Not if it's just a six, like we saw before, that didn't work. But if it's a closure or a lambda function, uh, you can uh, do that. You just write it afterwards. You call the function as if it took one less argument and then you provide the closure immediately afterwards. It makes for some quite neat looking syntax. Very confusing, if you ask me. Um, other things that are optional. Uh, well, sorry, this is the same example, but now there's some code in our lambda function. So what will this print? Any guesses? So here we're passing in 
um, a land function or a closure which has a, a command inside it. So will that six get printed? The answer is no. It almost looks almost exactly the same as before, but the, the actual contents of the closure is different. Now it's a closure with a command inside it, but we didn't actually call it. In order to call a closure, you would have to say b bracket bracket inside that print args function, but we didn't. We just said print b. So we're just printing out the uh, the closure object. We're not calling it. With me so far. Um, other things you can miss out. Um, you can miss out the square brackets when you're um, defining an array, so uh, under certain circumstances. So uh, this program, um, if you're familiar with Java syntax, maybe looks a little weird. What we have on the first line there is a map literal. So um, something that's been missing for ages from Java is literals for defining maps and other objects. You can define arrays um, using curly brackets uh, and then some stuff between commas. Um, but you can't define a map or you know, like a hash map or a tree map or something like that um, in Java, just in, all in one line. But in Groovy, you can. And here's the syntax: you just say open square bracket and then something colon something comma something colon something. And that makes a map. So when I ask you, when I ask Groovy to print out that map, it prints it out, and that's how it prints it out. It just prints it out, looking very similar to the way you typed it in the code. Um, what about this program? And this program. Uh, we're doing exactly the same thing, but we've missed out the square brackets. And given the title of this slide, you might think that this program will do exactly the same, do you? Uh, well, no, it doesn't. Uh, so you're not allowed to miss out the square brackets. You need the square brackets in order to um, define a map or, or to um, make a, a map, uh, write a map literal. Um, so you can't do that. What about this program? So here, instead of making a variable, um, and then printing it out on the next line. We're doing it all on one line. Will this work? What do you think? Well, yes, it does. So uh, is this surprising? Yes, it is to me. So um, when you are passing a map as an argument to a function, um, you can miss out the square brackets. You can just write it with the colons and the commas. Um, without the square brackets, and it, it knows that that's a map, and it passes that map as the argument to the function. So we can see here, we called the println function, gave it a map, and it printed out that map. Um, I'm not 100% sure what would happen if println took two arguments a and b. Maybe it would magically map those values to those arguments. Um, but I think maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't... I have time to look into that. Someone asked me that when I gave this talk at work, um, and I still haven't looked at it. Uh, what about this? Here I'm doing the same thing again, but I missed out the brackets. What's going to happen? Well, the same thing happens again. So, um, as maybe you would hope or expect, um, given what we've learned so far, you can miss out the brackets when you're calling a function, and it still has the same effect. So just take a moment to look at this line, println a colon three comma b colon four, um, and understand what that is. What that is, is a na the name of a method, and then some missing round brackets to say I'm calling that method. So we're calling a method with one argument, which is a map um, with keys a and b with different values. Um, so if you see code that looks like that in Groovy, that's what's really happening. Uh, and at first glance, that doesn't look like we're calling a method with a map as an argument, but that's what we're really doing. So that's one of the kind of clever things you might find in someone else's Groovy code, especially in a Gradle file. Um, that's what it really means. It means call a method, pass a map as an argument. Uh, other things you can do in Groovy that are pretty cool. Um, you can have extension methods. So here's an example of an extension method that's provided with Groovy um, on the integer class. So um, we've written the number four, and then we've said dot time. So that means call a method on the object, uh, which is which is four. So four is a integer with a capital I, and Groovy has defined some extension methods on the integer class. By the way, in Groovy there are no primitive uh, uh, types, so that four is an integer with a capital I, not 
a little I int, uh, if that means anything to you from your Java background. Um, so um, we're calling a method called times on the integer class, which has been kind of added in, grafted on by Groovy onto the uh, Java integer class. Um, and we're calling that method times with um, one argument, which is itself a lambda function or a closure, so an anonymous function. Which, so we're passing an argument in to times, which is a function. And what four dot times does, or what integer dot times does, is it does it calls the function it's been given that many times. So now can you guess what the output of this program is? Well, the output of this program is um, printing four times Andy is cool. Uh, this is the, this is the way you do the loops like that that kind of loop in Ruby. So this is Groovy and making it possible to do stuff uh, similar to how you would do it in Ruby. Um, the way it does that is, as part of the standard library of Groovy, it provides an extension method to the integer class. So that's just an example of an extension method, and we're going to look at how we can add our own to our own things as well. So now let's cast our eyes over a map class. So here is a... Uh, we're defining a variable here called letters, um, and into it we're putting a new tree map, and we're using the map literal syntax that we've already seen, to say it's a map with keys A, B, C, and Z with different numbers. Uh, notice those numbers are not in the same order as the alphabetical order of the letters. And we're making it a tree map. So the natural sort order of a tree map um, is in order of keys. Uh, and, and so maps in Groovy also have a method called each defined on them, uh, which loops through all of the entries in the map and does something. So when we say letters.each, we're calling that extension method that Groovy's added uh, to the map classes. In this case, it's a tree map. So the natural order, when you say each, you'll get them in the order that the map considers natural. So in a hash map, that could be effectively any order. Uh, in a tree map, it's in alphabetical order, or rather in the, the order of the keys, which in this case are uh, letters, so it'll be in alphabetical order. So that means you can predict what's going to get printed uh, when we run this program, right? Well, it's going to print all the entries in the map um, in alphabetical order. Notice the closure we've written, that a curly bracket print it, uh, close curly bracket, that closure or lambda or anonymous function. Um, if, you, if you're writing in Groovy uh, a closure like this and it takes one argument, but you can't be bothered to actually say which arguments it takes, you can just use a variable called it inside the closure, and Groovy knows that you mean uh, the argument I was passed. So it it is sort of code for the argument that I was given. So in this case, we're just printing out every entry of the map, and the way Groovy prints out an entry of a map is a equals two, or key equals value. Um, so in this case, we've gone through all the entries in this map and printed them out. And the order in which we printed them is the the natural order of that tree map. Okay, so that's, this is all uh, preamble to what we're actually going to do, which is we're going to add an extension method um, to a tree map, or to a map rather, um, which is we're going to call each in value order. So notice we've made letters again in this program, exactly the same as before, it's just gone off the side of the screen. Uh, and then we've modified the meta class of map. So this is how you add an extension method. So map.metaclass, that means add uh, get hold of the meta class. It's not. I. I don't really see. I don't really agree that it should be called meta. It's basically just a kind of modifiable, ver modifiable version or groovy modifiable version of this class. So map dot meta class means get me the thing I can add extension methods to, and then we say dot each in value order. So that's the name I've chosen for my extension method, and then equals, and then a whole big closure. So that's just an anonymous function that gets called. Um, so when you call each in value order, it actually calls this this code that, that's below there. What that code does is it gets hold of all the entries in the map, puts them in an array list, and then it sorts them. That's the middle line, line where it says entries.sort, and it sorts them by their values. So just off the right hand side of the um, screen, that just says e2.getValue. So basically sort them based on um, their values rather than their keys. And then what this each in value order function does 
is it calls each on that entries um, array list that we've made and for each of those each entry in uh, in that array list it actually passes in the argument that it was given so this is hopefully going to make sense in a minute so when, on the very bottom line you can see um, us calling that method so we've made this new extension method called each in value order and we've passed in what to do with every thing in that map and when I run it could, did you guess what it was going to do it prints them out but this time they printed out it where the, they're ordered by the values in the map the right hand side of the map so you can see the right hand side now I go one two three four but the letters are out of order so um, what our extension method does, don't worry about the details of what our extension method does, but what you can do in Groovy is you can change the map class or the integer class or any of the built-in classes to add on extra methods and actually to override or overload, remove and replace with your own um, methods, stuff that's already there. So you could write your own each and replace the each that was already there. And we haven't done that, we've made a new one called each in value order. Um, so if you see a method being called on an object like a map that you don't recognize, uh, that may be because it's an extension method like this. So this is just one of the other clever things people can do in Groovy that might fool you. If you didn't know, you could do this. That's how you do it. So now you can do it yourself and fool other people. Other things you can do. You can do operator overloading. Um, so here I am defining a class called PipeConcat. What this class does is holds onto a string, which I've called C, and it defines a method called plus. So this is how you define a method in a class in Groovy. Um, you just write def just like we were before. So we're not bothering to define, uh, to provide a return type for this plus method. And plus takes in one argument, which we're calling Y, and the body of the function is just a quoted string. Um, and by the way, another thing that you can miss out in Groovy is the word return. So the last line of any method in Groovy uh, is going to be the return value of that method. Uh, you don't have to write return, it just is. So in this case, this method's only got one line. Uh, so that is the return value of the method. By the way, this, this comes from stuff like Lisp, where it's pretty cool. Um, in Groovy, I find it fairly surprising because it kind of is kind of mixed in with code that does have return in it because uh, Java syntax is allowed and Java has requires you to write return. Anyway, you can do it in Groovy. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, we defined a class called PipeConcat, which holds onto just a string, and it has one method on it called plus. And what that method does is returns a string, and that string has some dollars in it. And uh, in Groovy, dollars um, in a string means that you substitute in the values of the things after the dollar instead of that dollar thing. So dollar $C will print out the value of C, and dollar $Y.C will print out the value of Y.C. So if we pass a pipe con cat in as the Y, we'll be printing out um, the, the strings inside the two, these two pipe con cats, the, the current one and the one that we passed in, and they'll have a pipe symbol in between them. Um, notice also a little bit further down, where we say def x equals blah, um, that, that new pipe con cat stuff that is a way of calling a constructor in Groovy, um, which doesn't exist. So if, you, if your pipe concat class has no constructor, you can actually construct it by passing in uh, the values of all of its fields uh, in, a, in a, a map style like this, in a, in a constructor that doesn't exist. So here we're constructing a new pipe concat with the value foo inside it, and then inside y we're putting the value bar. And then we're asking the program to print out what happens when you do x plus y? Now, the title of this slide is operator overloading. So maybe you've guessed that the plus method we've defined is how you overload operators. And you'd be right if you guessed that. So can you guess what this program is going to print? You got it. It's uh, foo and then a pipe symbol and then bar. So that, um, in, because inside the plus method, we stick the two, um, two ob the, the contents of the two objects together but we put a pipe symbol in between them. Notice, by the way, uh, not really relevant, but uh, a quirk of this program is um, that the plus method returns a string, not another instance of pipe concat. So if you did, a, if you plus that to something else, it wouldn't put another pipe in. It might even all go horribly wrong, depending on what you were doing. 
uh, but that's irrelevant. Basically, the main point is to overload operator plus, so that x plus y does something clever like this, you just define a method in a class called plus. Simple as that. Um, so you, when you're calling x plus y, you may not be calling what you think you're calling. That could be something else clever someone's done. Um, and that leads me to some of the fiddling around that I did in order to learn some of this stuff by making up an example. And in this example, I imagined I was uh, writing a famous uh, maze running game where there's ghosts and you have to eat dots. Um, where your character looks like a yellow wedge of stuff. So I've got a few examples of how this stuff could be applied um, that I wrote um, imagining that I was making this maze game. Um, here's this example. Do you like this code? This is valid groovy code. Um, and if you squint at it hard enough, you might just be able to see that this defines a maze. So this is like the design of a level um, that you've written in the groovy code. So you can see if you ignore all the underscores, you can see the walls are kind of percent signs. And then in the corners you've got stars, which are for um, power pills that might upgrade your character and make the ghosts all scared. If you look in the bottom left, you can see there's a plus sign, which is where your character starts off. And towards the middle you can see some pipe symbols, so that's where... Um, the ghosts start off at the beginning of the level. So this is the design of a level, uh, but written in code. No quotes or anything. This isn't a string. This is simply valid groovy code. Well, so how did I make it valid groovy code? Um, well, with a bit of stuff like this. So I defined a class called maze underscore, um, and I overrode a whole load of uh, operators on that class, and then I made a new uh, instance of that class whose name was underscore. So, you know, I told you to ignore all the underscores. Well, now you should unignore all the underscores in that code we were looking at. Um, and you can see um, every line is underscore and then some operator and then underscore and then some operator and so on and so on and so on. Um, well, the operators are overridden inside this class. So mod is what the percent sign uh, refers to. So when you, when you override, when you provide a method called mod, that's what gets called when it, you find a percent sign sticking two instances of this class together. But because underscore is an instance of this class, um, when you overload operator mod, you say underscore percent underscore, uh, it calls the mod method. Uh, and also I overrode a few others for to do. So the pipe symbol is or, uh, the plus symbol is plus, the star symbol is multiply. Um, and then for the very last... Um, for that get underscore method, that's so that, um, I can go, do I really need to do that? Um, yeah, that's for dot. Yeah, that's right. So, um, where I've done dot, that, uh, that's like a dot b, you know, some normal code that says a dot b, but I'm saying underscore dot underscore. So basically what that means is, um, get a property inside this object called underscore. But in Groovy, if you make a method called get and then something, um, Groovy knows that that's what method it should call when you say, if you say a dot b, it knows it should call get b on the a object. So in this case, it's calling get underscore on an object which itself happens to be called underscore. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, I overrode a load of operators. I made an instance of this class called underscore, and then I just stuck all the operators, um, stuck or stuck all the underscores together with operators. Um, and you might see groovy code that looks a bit like that and wonder how it works, and that's how it works. Um, you override operators, and then you can stick objects together using operators. Uh, so maybe it would be quite cool to define your mazes in your maze game like this in your groovy code. Maybe it would be a nightmare. Notice that I didn't actually get this working to define a maze. I'm sure I could have done. You could see the bodies of all these methods are just returning this, um, which is... Uh, not enough to actually know what the shape of the level is just from that code, but I'm pretty sure you could fill in that code. And for my next example, I really did fill in some of the code. Um, here's my next example. I made a class called Logic. Um, I, I wrote some stuff that looks a bit like English, and then at the bottom I told it to print out um, the rules that it had um, figured out from that stuff that looked like English. And when you run this program, 
it really does print out um, some rules that, that look like the kind of stuff that you typed in. So here's the output of the program. So basically, um, what we're doing here is defining kind of the behavior um, or the logic of the game, the gameplay of the game. But we're describing it in what looks like English. Um, but we're, then we're getting it out in something that um, looks like it could be usable as code. So um, basically when an event happens, like the start, or a ghost hits a player, or the player hits a pill, then do something. It's essentially how this logic works. I didn't. I started doing something more complicated than that, but um, this was enough. So um, you can see the if we focus on the syntax here, so like the, the logic is uh, may or may not be sensible logic for a maze game. Um, if you focus on the syntax, you can see that we're writing what look like English sentences, like at start, then ghost mode becomes normal. And when ghost hits player, then player dies. And that was very much like English, isn't it? When player hits pill, then ghost stop mode becomes rules, becomes, uh, scroll a bit, then ghost stop mode becomes scared, and pill becomes deleted. And then rules done is the extra little bit, um, just to say it's all finished. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, the, how could this be groovy code? Those are just words. Well, the first thing to notice is that when it gets to the end of the line, if it makes sense to stop, it'll stop there. So actually each of those are separate statements with a kind of omitted semicolon. Um, and then the next thing to note is that some of the rules that we um, already learned are going to apply here. So if you miss out the brackets, um, Groovy assumes that you're calling a method. So the first word in each of these sentences is a method, and the second word is an argument that's being passed to that method. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so for example, uh, if we look at the method called at um, in the class logic, which is that actually there's another method called at, which is just in a global name space, which is actually what's getting called, but it just calls this. And then there's a method on logic, which calls then. So essentially what we're doing is we're calling the method at, passing in the argument start, which is another variable that I've defined higher up and skipped here. Um, but then the, what, what Groovy does then is if you say another word after that, it doesn't think it's another argument. If there was a comma between start and then, uh, then it would think it was two arguments being passed into a method called at. But it doesn't, It um, because there's no comma, it assumes that there's essentially there's like a closing bracket after the word start, and then it it imagines that there's a dot before the next word. So it's saying at open bracket start close bracket dot then. So you can see there's a then method on this object that's getting returned. Um, um, so we call so we're calling dot then on this th the return value from at. And then the next thing is this ghost stop mode. So that's because those are written all together. Those are taken as one thing because the dot's there. So that um, passes in um, ghost stop mode as an argument to the then method. Um, and then the word becomes, is, it's actually assuming there's a dot before that. So then it's calling another method called becomes on the return value from then. Um, and then it assumes that we're passing, uh, the next thing is an argument to be passed to that becomes method. Uh, so normal is a variable that's being passed in as an argument to becomes. And the other lines work similarly. So basically the rule is the first thing's a method, the second thing's an argument, the third thing's a method that is called on the return value of that, the fourth thing is an argument, and the next thing's a method, then an argument, and a method, and an argument. They just alternate like that. Um, so it inserts brackets, and then it inserts a dot, and then it inserts brackets, and it inserts a dot. Um, and if we uh, if you do that, and then I actually implemented the contents of those methods sufficiently that I could print out something that looked like um, we'd kind of understood that code in a useful way. So I'm fairly confident um, we could have actually genuinely defined the logic of this game um, in that way. Whether that would be useful or confusing, I don't know. And whether it would be easy or hard to write that code without messing up the syntax. I don't know, but you might find groovy code that looks a bit like this because someone clever wrote it and you might be the poor doofus who has to understand it. Uh, hopefully this will help. It's basically method and then argument and then method and argument. Uh, okay, other things you get. So other things that you see, especially in Jenkins files and in Gradle files, 
um, you see this thing we've already seen called trailing closures, or which I'm calling trailing closures. So first of all, let's do a bit of um, preamble. Let's define a method called do it twice, which takes in an argument called fun. And the body of that method, what it does is it treats fun as a method, as a function that takes no arguments, and it calls it, and then it calls it again. So do it twice is a good name for this function. What it does is it takes in a function and calls that function twice. So now you want to be able to predict what happens if we call do it twice and pass in an anonymous function which prints out D. What will it do? That's right, it will print D twice because it, it gets passed in a function that prints D and it calls that function twice. Right, so we have preamble. So what happens if we call um, do it twice, uh, but we pass uh, but we, instead of writing a round bracket and then some curlies and so on, uh, we just write it like this. Well, actually, the same thing. So here, do it twice is being called um, with the, that closure as the argument to it, which won't be surprising, hopefully, because we've missed out the round brackets, and we know if we miss out the round brackets, the next thing is taken to be the argument of the function. Um, but now we're starting to see maybe um, what's going on in a Gradle file. So here's an example from a Gradle file. Um, we've got a function called uh, called dependencies, uh, and it takes in an argument, which is itself a closure or anonymous function, um, which has some other commands in it. So the, the kind of high-level view of what this little bit of code is, is call a function with one argument, which is a closure. Um, and then inside that closure, or anonymous function, we're calling a function called compile. And if you recognize this other pattern that we saw earlier, uh, compile is being called with one argument, which is a map of string to string. So another way of writing this would be like this. So first of all, there's some implicit imports um, of things like dependencies and compile, because those names are, uh, you're allowed to use those names, so they've obviously been implicitly imported somehow um, by Gradle before it executes your code, presumably. Um, and then actually, what's really r being run here is a method, dependencies, so I've put in the round brackets, I've put in a semicolon at the end just to show you what's going on. And then inside, uh, the, that, the argument to dependencies is a closure, and inside that closure, there's just one line of code, which is a method call to a method called compile. And what's being passed into compile is this map of, uh, of string to string. And I put quotes around the strings just to illustrate that those the left-hand side of that map is being treated as a string. Um, I used different quotes for the keys and values here, but that doesn't have any meaning. That's just what I wrote. I seem to somehow prefer double quotes. Okay, so what about Jenkins files? Well, often you'll see a Jenkins file, declarative um, pipeline Jenkins file looks like this. Um, so it has this word pipeline and then a curly bracket and then it has this word stages and a curly bracket and then a stage and so on and so on and so on. And notice here, we haven't only got um, method name and then an argument which is a closure. Further down, we've got this stage, open bracket, build, close bracket, and then a curly bracket. And you remember we saw that pattern before where uh, actually what that is is stage takes two arguments. Stage is a method which takes two arguments. And we're passing in the first argument, build, um, a string. And then and then we're closing the round bracket and then writing afterwards a closure. Um, and Groovy reads that as actually two arguments being passed into stage. So you're totally allowed to do this. Uh, and that's what it means. So stage is a method or function that takes two arguments, a string, and a closure itself. So that curly bracket starts a closure or anonymous function or a lambda, um, and uh, passes. Uh, so that gets passed in as the second argument to stage, and then inside that. So there's all these closures inside closures here. So there's a pipeline method which takes in a closure, stages which takes in a closure, stage which takes in a string and a closure, and then inside that closure we call steps which takes in a closure, and then we call a method called echo, which takes a string, and then we take, call a method called dir, or dir, which takes in a string and a closure, again, with the same kind of syntax. 
Then we call a method called catch error, which takes in a closure itself. So you can see it's all these closures within closures within closures. Um, and here's what it's what's really happening in some sense. Uh, there's some static imports up the top, implicitly done by Jenkins. And then, as I said, um, well, I've inserted a load of brackets to hopefully make it a bit clearer what's happening, especially if you look at stage. What's really happening is we're calling stage with two arguments, a string and a closure. Um, and then uh, bear in mind also on that last line, we're calling a method called sh, and um, the argument we're passing is a string, which is basically what to what code to execute. So sh in a Jenkins file means run this command. Uh, and in the shell, that's why it's sh. Um, so hopefully that clears up a little bit for you uh, what's really going on in a Jenkins file or in a Gradle file. Um, when you see this kind of nice looking but but hard to understand code or hard for me to understand anyway so how I got into this is I looked at my Jenkins file and I and I had heard oh this is groovy code but I had no idea how this was code at all it looked more like you're just a definition of a kind of map of names to values or something like that um, actually it is groovy code and it uses these features of groovy uh, to remove some of the syntax um, which can make it look nice, but can also make it very confusing when you're then writing code which um, actually does stuff. Um, makes it hard to know, for example, when will my code run? Uh, I think the answer is uh, almost all of the code that's actually written down here gets run pretty early on in the Jenkins process, but most of it doesn't actually do anything except kind of remember some stuff that it's going to do later. I think. Perhaps one day I'll make a video about what's actually happening in your uh, when you run your Jenkins file or your Groovy file, uh, if I ever understand it. Um, so a little bit of uh, gotchas and fun. So that was that was the kind of useful content of this talk. Uh, what's happening in Gradle files? What's happening in Jenkins files? Um, uh, now a couple of things that might catch you out, and then something uh, that I thought was uh, funny. So. First of all, uh, let's talk a little bit more about string interpolation. We, we mentioned it a little bit. If you write a dollar inside a string, um, it'll, it replaces what's after the dollar with, or the dollar and what's after the dollar, with what's after the dollar, the kind of the value of what's after the dollar, treating it as code or something like that. Um, so here we've made a closure or anonymous function or lambda called don't run me. Um, notice, by the way, um, you can define, we've been defining a lot of closures that take no arguments. <clears throat> you can also write um, lambdas or closures which do take arguments and the way you do that is you say argument name, comma, argument name <clears throat> and then you write this little arrow symbol. But you can also do that if you take zero arguments like I have done here. So don't run me. Uh, after the opening curly bracket is uh, a little arrow symbol uh, and there's nothing before that so that means I don't take any arguments. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, sometimes you have to do that because Groovy doesn't know whether this is a closure or a code block, and a sort of normal code block. Um, uh, you also might want to, if you find it easier to understand that this is a closure rather than a normal code block. Uh, and here I've just done it as an example. So that's what it looks. That's what it means if you see a little arrow like that. It just means it's a closure that takes no arguments. Uh, what is what this? Uh, the anonymous function does is it prints out don't run me and then it returns because remember you don't need the word return it just returns the last line it returns uh, you ran me didn't you uh, uh, as a uh, just a string value return value so if we run this program um, it defines don't run me and then it then it prints out don't run me and then it um, doesn't print out. It just it, there just is a string there in the code which it doesn't do anything with, which is don't run me equals dollar don't run me. Um, so, uh, what will this program print? How confident are you after watching that you have any clue? Um, well, this well eventually this example will involve some stuff we haven't touched on yet, but so far it doesn't. What it will print is. Um, the value of the closure. So that second last line where it prints out 
don't run me. It doesn't run, don't run me or anything like that. It doesn't execute that code. Uh, it just says print out uh, this variable. And when when you've got a Lambda function in a variable, it just prints it out looking like this. Um, just to say, yep, it's a function. It's a closure. Uh, what if we ran this program? So it's exactly the same, except we convert that string that we don't use for anything on the last line to uppercase. What will this program print? Any guesses? Are you surprised? What this program prints is the same as last time for the, the second last line. And then on the last line, somehow it ends up running that closure. So why is it doing that? Well, this certainly to me was a bit of a gotcha. I mean, it's a bit of a gotcha that it does this anyway, but in particular, it's a bit of a gotcha that it only does it in certain cases. So what happens is, if you name a closure in a string, um, uh, when it converts that string to an actual string that it's going to print out or do something useful with it, um, it won't just insert like the the kind of value of that closure um, like on the first line of the printing out here, because presumably that's probably not what you wanted. You didn't want to substitute in like a reference to a closure with a, with a load of numbers. And it, what you probably wanted to do was run that closure. And that's uh, that's the way Groovy uses actually to kind of defer execution of something inside a string interpolation until later. It lets you just name a closure and then it will run it for you. Um, so in this case, that don't run me does actually get run um, because uh, uh, that's what you do. When, it, when a closure is mentioned in a string after a dollar, it should be run. But the question is, why was it... So that's why it was run in, in this program. The question is, why wasn't it run in the last program that didn't call to uppercase? And the answer is slightly complicated, and hopefully something you won't have to think about too often, but if you do, it's going to confuse you if you didn't already see it. Hopefully this will be useful then. So... Uh, on the first, in this first program, we're making a string value which we then don't use, but that's not really relevant. We're making a string value which is of type G string, which stands for groovy string. Uh, it's difficult to say without sniggering, um, but yeah, it makes a value of type G string, um, which is a special groovy string type which uh, possibly has string interpolation inside it, which is still left to do. And in this case, that's exactly the situation. Um, there, there's, we've got this G string and it hasn't been, uh, hasn't had its string interpolation done on it. When we call two uppercase, um, we have to do our interpolation. So at that point, in order to call two uppercase, as in to make everything uh, in the string uh, that was lowercase uppercase, um, you, we have to first of all have the letters in that string. So we have to do our string interpolation. So just as a side effect of calling to uppercase, what we actually do is then execute the string interpolation. And part of the string interpolation is any closures you find mentioned after a dollar, actually run them. Don't just put a reference to them in the string. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully if something weird is happening with strings, it might be something to do with um, your string interpolation hasn't happened yet when you expected that it would have done, or it has happened. Um, and it's um, called closures when you weren't expecting it to, maybe. Something else. If you're cool enough, uh, you could try this trick. So um, uh, you may find it a little bit disturbing that you don't have to put semicolons in your code, but if you're pretty cool, you might be able to kind of replace them like this. So let's make an object called Yoable, which is just a map of, of Yo to Null. Um, and then let's make a function called coolprint. What oh, that does is it takes in a message, it prints it out, and then the return value is just this yoable thing um, that we defined before. Uh, so now we can call this function coolprint. Uh, and what do you think it does? Well, that's right, it prints out sup. Good, it's pretty cool. Um, so nothing surprising about that. We returned this thing, but we didn't do anything with it. What this allows us to do is to make our program just a little bit cooler. So we can write this. After every um, function that we call, we can just say yo. 
you know, because we're that cool. Uh, and if it bothers us that we're not allowed, or we, well, we are allowed, if, if it bothers us that we're missing out semicolons all over the place, and we feel we ought to punctuate our code in the same way that we punctuate our speech yo, um, by putting the word yo after, after our method calls, we can just go ahead and do that. Yo. And, um, this code is perfectly valid, groovy. And it works exactly the same as the previous code, yo. So we've just, um, called our method call print, passed in a string, sup. Um, what call print does is prints out the string that we passed it and returns a map. Called Yoable. Uh, and Yoable is a map, one of whose values is Yo. And because we wrote cool print and then space Yo, uh, that uh, you will recall, Groovy understands to mean something, something dot Yo. So cool print returns a map, and one of the values of the map is Yo. So it's absolutely fine for us to go and look up that value by just typing Yo, which is understood to mean dot Yo as in go and look at that map and find the value called yo. And then we don't do anything with that value. So you too can make your code cooler and punctuate your commands with the word yo or even some other cool word if you felt the inclination. So that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, if you have any questions, post them um, in the YouTube. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope when you find some clever code um, done in Groovy, um, this will give you a little bit more of a chance of figuring out what's going on. See you next time.